Thank you, Lindsay. It's so good to be back. I uh, am using this microphone because the last time I was here to speak with you, I broke the microphone. And in the first service, I got up and broke the microphone. So if it's all right, I'm going to go Pentecostal on you this morning. Hey, it's great to be back, man. This is home for us, meaning this church. People say all the time, hey, what do you miss about Colorado? Of course, you know, you have the mountains, 300 days of sunshine, less than 100 degree weather. I mean, all of those things. But what we say to people is above all those things, man, we miss our church family. Like we absolutely loved our time here, and you guys were so formation, such formations uh, in our spiritual journey. In fact, my wife and I uh, are about to join a church plant uh, in the city that's coming to where, uh, coming to the city in which we live. And when I dropped her off this morning, I just simply said, "Sweetheart, you can you just believe with me that God's going to do something like this where we're at?" And so I just want you to know we love you. We're so honored to be back. So thrilled uh, to be in worship with you. Uh, and I love Pastor JT. I, I got to tell you, man, he is one of the most humble leaders I've ever known. In fact, a few months ago, he, we happened to be in the same place, and he was just kind of shepherding my heart. So in a lot of ways, from a 1,000 miles away, he's still kind of my pastor. And so, uh, man, I, I love him. And, and just a privilege to be back. I want to invite you to turn to Acts chapter 12 this morning. As you're turning uh, to Acts chapter 12, uh, you know, the opportunities I've had to speak here, there might just be a recurring theme that comes out of my life every time I speak. And it's just kind of when you get to the depths of my heart, I kind of have one uh, pure and holy obsession with what I want to see the Lord do. And that is simply this, that in my lifetime, and maybe you're like me, in my lifetime, I so desperately want to see a move of God among a generation that is unparalleled to anybody else that's that's perhaps ever walked on, on planet earth together as a generation. I so desire to see God, man, just pour out his presence and his power afresh and anew. And just as you work those kind of things out in your life, you just begin to discover what you believe to be our keys to that kind of movement of the spirit of God. And to me, uh, man, just on you know, my journey over the last year, even as I've left here, just God has continuously brought me back to this what I believe to be a key in my own life and a key in the life of the church of the outpouring of the spirit and the presence of God in a new and a fresh and a powerful way. And the crazy thing is it's gonna kind of seem when I tell you what I wanna spend time talking with you about this morning, it's gonna kind of seem somewhat elementary to the life of a believer because it's, it's simply one of those things we're supposed to do. It's one of those things that, that we just, uh, you know, just kind of think that it's just a natural part of our life. But, but the truth of the matter is this, don't forget this statement, that which we... Uh, 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 don't attend, uh, rarely attend to, or that which we assume happens, we rarely attend to. And so what I want to speak to you today on is just a simple thought process of the power of God and the prayers of his people. Because I believe with every fathom of my being, if we're going to see an outpouring of the Spirit of God in a way that our generation has never seen, of course it's going to come through people coming to know Christ. It's going to come through discipleship. It's going to come through us not sitting and soaking, but us being equipped and going. But I'm telling you, friends, if we're going to experience an outpouring of the Spirit of God like we've never seen before, I believe we've got to become a praying people like we've never prayed before. And the truth of the matter is, some of us were like my sons. I have four kids. Uh, you can pray for me because as of two weeks ago, I have three teenage boys in my house now. I've got an 18-year-old, a 14-year-old, a 13-year-old, and a 10-year-old daughter. And so life is busy. It's hectic. It's, it's not even controlled chaos anymore. It's just uncontrolled chaos. But my middle son, he is massive. He's Red hair, fire engine red hair. He's, he's going in ninth grade. He's now six foot, 180 pounds. And I'll just be really honest with you. Uh, I'm devastated. I can't take him anymore. I mean, I've tried. I tried. I, I can't. Now, I don't tell him that, but I can't. And so uh, he's this massive human being. And uh, uh, he, uh, when he was little, decided that he wanted to play soccer. Now, the cool thing about having a massive human being as your son is that he always ran over everybody. And it was, from a dad's perspective, it's like, that's awesome, man. And, uh, and, and so he decided he wanted to play soccer. 
And so he got out on the field. I don't know, he's like kindergarten. He got out on the field, and, and man, he was just running kids over everywhere. And again, from, a, from, a dad, from the rule book of dad, it was like, this is amazing. Everybody knows my son. It's like the parting of the Red Sea. Every time he gets the ball, nobody wants to be around him. From the rule book of soccer, it was like, you can't do that, son. So his coach was continuously saying, you can't do that, Carter. And so if you've ever had kids playing soccer, like little kids playing, you understand what I'm saying. It's like one cluster of kids moving down the field together like the ball just stays within the cluster and if one of them happens to accidentally kick it it might go in so I was searching for him during this game and in this cluster and he's easy to stand out because I say his hair is fire engine red curly hair he's like opie on steroids y'all I'm just telling you and I couldn't find him so I look out finally I see him at the back of the field He is literally sitting down, as kids would say, crisscross applesauce, legs crossed, arms crossed, and I'm a competitive man. I'm super competitive. And I'm like, that he is acting like his mother. I don't know what's going on. We got I'm running down there and I say to him, I said, Carter, what are you doing? And he said, Dad, I quit. You can't quit, son. You ever seen that movie? There's no crying in baseball. You can't quit in the middle of a game, son. What is wrong with you? And he said, Dad, this is not what I signed up for. I quit. Now, being competitive in a kindergarten telling you that doesn't mix well. So I made my way very uh, urgently over to the other side of the field and got right by his ear. I won't tell you everything I said uh, about, uh, about get up now or you got it when you get home. But I said, Carter, here's the deal. I got to ask Carter, you got to get up, man. You can't quit. You're in the middle of the game. Your team needs you. Get up and finish the game and do what you're supposed to do. He gets up, he finishes the game. That was the last time he played soccer, but it was finished the game. (laughs) But I just wonder how many of us today, we're like my son. When it comes to praying, God hasn't answered our prayer the way we want him to. Maybe it is that you've been praying and praying and praying and God hasn't answered your prayer in the timing you expect him to. And so your response is not to be more diligent in praying. Your response is to sit down and to say, God, I quit, man. You've not answered my prayers the way I want them to. You've not answered my prayers in the timing that I want them to. So God, instead of trusting and pressing in and, and, and working harder at praying, I'm just going to back off. I'm going to cross my legs and my arms. And God, I'm just going to declare today I quit. So how many of you in your prayer life, that would be the posture you have taken? God has not answered the way I want to, when I want to, therefore I quit. Well, man, today we're going to see in this story a church that did not quit praying. And we're going to see just three simple things. And this is going to be somewhat, again, elementary to you. But the truth of the matter is, I honestly believe if, if we as individual followers of Christ and we as a church could grasp what this church seemed to know. Man, I believe that God could do things that would blow our minds away. The first thing we see is this story. Let me give you just a little bit of context. Peter is arrested. In fact, Herod had just killed, in chapter 12, verse 1, Herod had just killed James, the brother of John, with a sword. And he realized, and it became blood hungry, he realized that the people really enjoyed the fact that he did that and they appreciated it. And so in chapter one, we're gonna pick up that he, I mean, chapter 12, we're gonna pick up that he arrests Peter and intends to do the same thing with Peter. Peter is essentially arrested and he's essentially placed on death row. So let's find chapter 12, verse one. And it says, about that time, Herod the king laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church. He killed James, the brother of John, with a sword, and when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. This was during the days of unleavened bread, and when he had seized him, he put him in prison, delivering him over to four squads of soldiers to guard him, intending that after the Passover to bring him out to the people. Now, This is a bad situation. There seems to be no hope. Peter is arrested. He knows what just happened to James. It is inevitable that he's going to be drug out and bloodthirsty Herod is going to get more cheers and attaboys uh, for, for executing Peter. So it seems that for all practical purposes, all hope is lost. Peter has no choice. He has no chance. He has no hope. There's no light at the end of the tunnel. And then verse five happens. And let me just stop and say to you today that I don't know what you're bearing. Here's what I can tell you. I came in this morning bearing some really heavy weights. 
Like my heart is really burdened about some things. And I'm just naive enough to believe that there's a lot of you all over this place that you're bearing some kind of weight and burden whether it's a relational burden or it's a child or it's a grandchild or it's a job or it's a health or whatever it, it might be. And man, you're just feeling the weight of that. Can I just encourage you today? Everybody needs a verse five in their life. Everybody. Here's verse five. He's in jail. He's in prison. So verse five. So Peter was kept in prison. Here we go. You ready for this? This is about to change the trajectory of Peter's life. It's about to change the trajectory of the church, of the future of the church as he continues to lead. Listen to what it says. But earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. Now notice what doesn't happen. It doesn't say Peter is arrested. Peter is on death row. Peter is, is hopeless. The situation has no hope. And the church gathered together around a whiteboard and developed another strategy. The church developed a really cool modern day acrostic. No, the church developed a, 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 a poster and they put Peter's name on it and they said, let's gather together at, at the jail and maybe just maybe we can, we can hook a truck up to it or a, a wagon, I guess it was, or a, a donkey or whatever it was and we can just rip the bars off. No, listen to me. They didn't have those options. You know the one option they had? The church had to get busy praying. They couldn't go appeal it to a judge. No attorney to go make his case. It was hopeless. But look what happens. Verse 5. But earnest prayer was being made to God by the church. The first thing I want us to see, three simple things that we learn from the church and the power of God, the prayer of people. The first thing we understand is the church prayed earnestly. Now, now look what he doesn't say. It doesn't say Peter has no hope. He was kept in prison. He had four squads of soldiers to guard him, and the church had a moment of silence. No. The church kind of gathered together in a half-hearted way, and, and a few of them prayed. No, listen to what it says. An earnest prayer was being made. The Greek word for earnest here is, can be interchanged with fervently or strenuously, which means that they put their whole body into their prayer. It was a, it was a action of hard work, hard praying, passionate, fervent, earnest prayer. Like I can't fathom, my friends, that in the midst of this situation where there's no hope, that this church gathered together and were timid and quiet. I, I can only picture this church, you walking in this room and there's some laid out on the floor, there's some on their knees, there's some pacing and each and every one of them are going after the throne room of God with everything they can, trying to get the heart's attention of the Father saying, oh God, if you don't show up, our friend is doomed. If you don't show up, there is no hope. If you don't show up, he will not last. Isn't it interesting here that when all seems lost, the answer to the early church was prayer. In fact, isn't it interesting that Jesus never primarily says that my house will be a house of preaching even though we gather together and we hear the words of God and we let them penetrate our heart and change our lives. Isn't it interesting that he doesn't really say my house is going to be the primary reason for my house is going to be a house of discipleship or missions or, or even worship. No, what does Jesus say? My house shall be a house of what? Prayer. And so as we look across the landscape of the evangelical world and we go, man, the sky seems to be falling. It seems like churches aren't experiencing a fresh move of God. Listen to me. How can we expect the blessing of God, the hand of God, the anointing of God, and the favor of God if we're not even doing what Jesus said, this is what my people primarily gather to do? And here's what happens. This church is gathered and they're praying and they're earnestly crying out before the Lord. So let me ask you a question this morning. How's your prayer life? Or is your prayer life limited to praying before meals or before bed? Or, man, is there a time that you carve out to go after the throne of God? You know who I want to learn to pray about? Like, have you ever seen the lady in War Room? That lady? Like, I want to pray like that lady does. Like, I want people, if they walk by and see me pray and they think I'm crazy, man. They're like, what in the world is this guy doing? Because I want to be that fervently pray, locked in to praying and earnestly praying. All of you have experienced a prayer circle, haven't you? You ever been in one of those circles where I've never understood it? I can't fathom, I, can't, I just can't conceive. Why do we have to hold hands when we pray? It's crazy, man. Like, 
We gather in a circle. You've been there. We hold hands. They pick the person next to you to start, so you're going to kind of be towards the end. About a third of the way through, the person prayed the prayer you were going to pray, and now you're out of the spirit and in the flesh. Like, man, that was my idea. God needed to hear that from me. So now you're mad, you're not listening, you're not spiritual, and you're trying to think of what you're going to pray, and finally you think, I got it, I'm super creative, I'm moving in. And three people down from you, that person prays your second prayer, and now you're doomed. You ever notice at the end of those prayers, people squeeze your hands? That's creepy, man. You say, no, next time, promise you, I promise you the person's going to squeeze your hand. Like, I don't picture this church in this moment of desperation, in a prayer circle, trying to think about cool prayers to pray. I picture this church on their face before God saying, God, if you don't move, there is no hope. We are desperate for a movement of your hand. In fact, the, to contrast that prayer circle, we've all been in it. It's, the, the contrast to that is an experience I had when I was a pastor. We got a call one night that a missionary that we supported was on a boat headed to an island to share the gospel and the boat capsized and nobody had heard from him all through the night. And we called the church to get together. We said, come to the church now. I mean now. And we went to the church and we got on our face and then we began to beg God, God, if you don't show up, our friend is gone man. We don't know what's going to happen to him. And as we were praying, true story, as we were praying, we get a phone call that they had just found him hanging on to a piece of wood from the boat with sharks circling around him. Like, listen to me. We didn't get together and circle and squeeze hands, man. We got together and we poured out our heart before the Lord. That's what I believe this church was doing for their friend. When you think about your son or your daughter that's running from God or doesn't know Christ or your husband or your wife or your mother or your father or your friend or your coworker who does not know Christ or they're running from God and it seems impossible, listen to me, are you earnestly chasing the heart of God with all out earnest, fervent, strenuous prayer? Or are you just going silently saying, God, if you would, would be pleased to don't listen, let's listen, friends. This church got to busy doing the business of prayer on behalf of their friend. We see this. The church was prayed earnest, praying earnestly. The second thing we see, I love this, the church was praying daringly. Now, this is a really cool story how this begins to happen. I'm going to just paraphrase verse 6 through 12 because it's uh, a little long. So what happens is this church begins praying earnestly. And so Peter is going to sleep. Now, I don't understand this because if I knew this was probably my last night to live, the only way I'm sleeping is if I'm in a food coma from all the food I'd asked them to bring me. Like, how do you sleep on the last night that you're going to live? But it says he was so sound asleep that the angel had to strike him on his side to wake him up. Like, he's out. The angel wakes him up, tells him to get dressed, tells him to put on his cloak, takes him outside of the city. And then there's a, a, a verse that when he gets outside of the city in verse 11, it says, when Peter came to himself, he said, now I am sure the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from the hand of Herod from all the Jewish people were expecting. It wasn't until he was dressed and outside of the city when the angel left that Peter realized this is for real, man. God has rescued me. Now watch this. I love this. He goes to the house where they're praying. Verse 13. And when he knocked at the door of the gateway, a servant girl named Rhoda came to answer. Recognizing Peter's voice in her joy, she did not open the gate, but ran in and reported that Peter was standing at the gate. So don't miss this. The church is praying. They're begging God to move. They have no idea that God is moving while they're praying. But they were praying and begging and earnestly seeking the Lord for their friend. Peter gets awakened by the angel, put outside the city gates, realizes, man, this is for real. He goes to the house where they're praying. He knocks on the gate. The servant girl comes out. She sees him or hears him and realizes this is Peter. She doesn't even open the door in shock. She slams it and runs back into the church and, and to the house where they pray. Can you imagine? They're praying, man. They're getting busy. And she goes, excuse me, I have an announcement. They're like, hey, Rhoda, we're praying, man. Our, our friend's about to die. There's no time for announcement. She's like, no, you don't get it. Peter is out there. Listen to the response of the church. I'm not making this up. Verse 15. 
And they said to her, you are out of your mind. But she kept insisting that it's so, and they kept saying, it's his angel. Peter is there. She goes to tell the church who is praying that Peter be rescued, that Peter has been rescued, and he's at the front gate, and all they can say is, no way, man, that's crazy. (laughs) You're out of your mind. That's his angel. He's already gone, for heaven's sakes. She's like, guys, I'm telling you, God has answered our prayers. You see, not only was the church praying earnestly, but the church was praying prayers so big that, watch this, both the main characters were surprised when God answered it. <laughs> Peter doesn't even realize it. He's like, man, what is this? Is this a vision? Is this like a dream before I go to be with heaven? No, he is now outside of the gate. He is rescued, signed, sealed, delivered. He's out, man. And, and all of a sudden, he's like, what just happened? Then he goes to tell them, you're not going to believe what happened. And they go, no, that's not him. That's not happening. (laughs) Hey, listen to me. Let me ask you this question. In your life, what are you praying that is so big that even you would be astounded if God truly answered it? What are you praying that is so beyond the scope of your ability are so beyond the scope of your ability to manipulate the situation that if God were to answer it, the only person that could get honor and glory would be God himself. You see, this is what's happened. This church is praying daringly. They are praying with everything they have. John Maxwell says this, dream dreams so big that unless God is in it, you're doomed for failure. I would change that to the modern day church and say this, what would your life and my life look like? What would our church look like? What would our communities and our cities and our states look like if we prayed prayer so big that unless God's in it, there's no way they're answered. There's no way it happens. Man, all over this room, if I'm just being honest with you today and you don't know me, and that's, that's, that's good. <laughs> but if I'm just honest with you today, there's things in my life that I've got to have God show up. And there's things that cause me Really, for the last several days to get up and prayer walking, five o'clock in the morning, one night, three o'clock in the morning, just, just bearing me, weigh, weighing me down and the burdens I bear. But you know what? The, the good news is, man, the word of God says that we can cast our cares and anxieties on him because he cares for us. But what are you praying that is so bold? Now, listen, I can't promise you God will answer it in, his, in your timing or in the way that you want him to answer. But I can promise you he hears your cries. What are you praying that's so bold, that's so daring, that if God doesn't answer it, you're doomed for failure? You say, Nathan, these kind of things don't happen, man. These prayer movements you're talking about, listen to me. I want to tell you of two churches. We now live in Texas. I want to tell you of two churches that, that we're directly connected with that are experiencing a fresh wind of the movement of God because they got together as a church and began pray. I'm so excited. Man, I wish I wasn't flying out tonight. I'd be at your prayer service. Your prayer service ought to actually be bigger than your worship services. And so there's a church in Houston, Texas, that in January 2020, the pastor became burdened that, that everything that he's tried has, has, he said, look, man, we've got more people than we've ever had. We've got more money than we ever had. We've got more staff than we ever had. And yet we are spiritually dead and he said, something's missing, and God's convicted me that we're not a praying church. And when there is no prayer, there is no power. And so he said, man, we're going to start a prayer service. And he started a prayer service in September of 2020. Since that time, right at 800 people have come to faith in Christ through that prayer service. He told me not too long ago, he said, listen, Nathan, he said, let me tell you a real-time story. He said there was a young, young child who had, had, had had seizures off and on their whole life, and, and, and mom and dad were just exhausted. So at a prayer service, they decided they would bring this child up to be prayed over, the, over uh, by the elders and anointed with oil and prayed over by the church. And, and so they brought this child, and they anointed this child with oil, and they prayed, and they asked God to, to, to touch this child's body. He said, man, we just got to celebrate six months as a church of praying over that child, and that child hasn't had one symptom. Uh, Caesar since that time we prayed. Now, I know some of you think, well, that's just kind of weird. Hey, listen, we don't have a monopoly on the Holy Spirit. <laughs> that's just when people pray, I believe God moves. Second story is in Longview, Texas. Longview's East Texas, man. It's East Texas. 
And this pastor sees this other guy start a prayer service, and he says, we're, same thing, man. We, we're multi-site now. We're growing, but we're not experiencing the presence of God. Listen to me. The presence of God that when people get out of their car, they sense something's different about this place. And he said, so we decided we would start a prayer service. And in January of 2021, by the way, both of these right in the middle of COVID, January 2021, they start a prayer service at this church in Longview. Since that time, almost 500 people have come to faith in Christ through that prayer service. Well, I see this. He has a man that comes up to him at the end of the prayer service and says, Pastor, i got to talk to you tomorrow. The guy comes to his office and he sits down. He says, what's going on? He said, Pastor, I've been in church my whole life. And he said, i got a problem. He said, what's your problem? He said, that prayer service I've been coming to has wrecked my life. <laughs> so what do you mean it's wrecked your life? And here's what he said. He said, Pastor, I realized that I'm seeing God save all these people. I'm seeing God answer all these prayers. Here's what he said. And Pastor, I realize that I can't talk to God like that because I don't know God like that. And he said, I want to give my life to Jesus today because I want to talk to God like that. So, man, they, he leads him to Christ. They baptize him the next Sunday morning. They tell his story. Man, here comes another one. Here comes another one. Say, that's my story. I want to know God like that so I can pray. Man, they've had staff members, spouses give their life to Christ. They've had deacons give their life to Christ. They've had church leaders say, man, I want to know Christ like that. And God has breathed a fresh wind of his spirit upon that church, and they are seeing unbelievable movements of God. Hey, friends, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, the church, this church prayed earnestly, and God heard their prayers. This church prayed daringly, big prayers, and God heard their prayers prayers. But third, I love this. The church prayed faithfully. What do you mean? Look at verse 12. Peter realizes God has rescued him. Look what happens. And when he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose other name was Mark, where many were gathered together and were what? Praying. Check this out. This church had no idea that God had already answered their prayers. But what were they found doing by the one God answered their prayers with? They were found Praying. Let me tell you something, friend. I don't know what you're walking through. I really don't. But here's what I know. I can assure you that whatever you're walking through, God is moving in. It might not be in the way you want it, not maybe in the time you want it. It might not be the manner in which you want it, the mode in which you want it, the method in which you want it. But I'm telling you, God is moving. And our job is not to try to criticize how God answers or when God answers. Our job is to pray and trust the sovereignty of God to answer. And our job is as we pray to be faithfully found praying and asking because as we are praying, God is moving. So let me ask you this question. As you think about that burden, that thing that's weighing you down, you think about that relationship in your life that, that's, 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 that's a struggle. You think about that, that, that child or that grandchild or that neighbor or that coworker that's lost or doesn't know Christ. Let me ask you this. How are you praying for them, man? Is it just when it comes to mind or are you going hard after the throne of God? Like are you making it a priority to chase the presence of God in that circumstance? How are you praying and what are you praying for? Man, are you, are, you, are you praying for prayers that really, at the end of the day, you can kind of make it happen? Are you praying prayers that if God doesn't show up, it's not going to happen? Are you praying prayers that if God does show up, only he can get the glory for? And then thirdly, who are you praying for? Everybody in this room has got somebody in your life that's running from God or doesn't know him. Man, are you begging God for their soul? Are you crying out to God on their behalf? Are you chasing hard after the movement and the presence of God in their life through your prayer life? You see, this church was praying earnestly. They knew that if God didn't show up, it was doomed. This church was praying daringly. They, had, they knew they had to position their heart and posture their heart to be desperate for a movement of God beyond their own ability. And third, this church was praying faithfully. Though they didn't know God was answering, they were still found faithful praying. A few years ago when I was living here in Colorado, I had the privilege of getting to know a guy who wrote a book that kind of went wildly successful. If you've never read it, I would highly encourage you to read it. It's called Fresh Wind, Fresh Fire. It's the story of the Brooklyn Tabernacle. The Brooklyn Tabernacle is in the heart of Brooklyn. At this time years ago, they would gotten down to about 12 to 15 people. It's surrounded by drugs and prostitution and, and gangs, and it was just a desperate situation. It was so desperate. It was such a heavy burden. 
that Pastor Jim Cimbala, who was the pastor, was a young man. He got physically sick, and he went to Florida, and he got on a boat, and he got out in the middle of the water, and he began to say to God, God, I can't do this. It is beyond me. I, can't, I simply can't do it. And God began to calm his mind and his heart and his soul, and God began to say to him, Jim, if you'll lead my people to pray and be a people of prayer, you won't have to ever worry about my spirit being with you. So with some courage and boldness and some direction from the Lord, he goes back and he leads his people to have a prayer service. Now, the Brooklyn Tabernacle is known for two main things. Number one, they're known for their choir. They have a mass choir full of people who have been radically transformed by the gospel. Who, who uh, The choir is led by his wife, and she's known because she can't even read music, but yet she leads this choir all over the world. And the Brooklyn Tabernacle Choir is amazing. But secondly, they're known for their Tuesday night prayer service. If you've never been, there's nothing like it. I'm telling you, there's nothing like it. I've never been in a place where people are praying so earnestly, so passionately that the partner they partner you up with and you can't even hear their prayers because people are going after God's throne and his presence with such enthusiasm and passion. And I said, Pastor, I, I got to know him. I said, Pastor, man, can I bring a group of Colorado pastors up to meet with you and understand and learn how to develop a prayer culture because I believe this is what's gonna change everything for us. And he said, yes, you can. And so I took 56 pastors from Colorado up to Brooklyn Tabernacle. We had dinner, and then he came in and spoke to us after dinner, and he started telling us the story of the Brooklyn Tabernacle and all that God had done and this world-renowned church now, just how, how God had just poured out his presence and his spirit and his power upon this because these people would begin to pray. And here's what he said. He just began to pivot in the story somewhere where we didn't realize he was going. And he said, I want to tell you guys a story. And he tells us a story of his daughter named Chrissy. And he said, guys, here I was. I'm a world-renowned pastor. I've written a best-selling book. I'm known for prayer. I'm known for our prayer service. I'm known for our church. But yet my daughter ran away. And he said, we had no idea where she was at. We could not find her. And, and we just had no idea where she was at. And he said this. He said, our hearts were crushed. We were scared. We were anxious. And we were so exhausted because we had prayed so hard that God would help us find her. But yet God hadn't. And he said, it was a Wednesday night choir service. And he said, a young lady walked up to my wife who led the choir just with a little note that said, Miss Carol, I think we ought to stop everything and pray for Chrissy tonight. Pastor Jim said, guys, I'm just telling you, we were so exhausted, embarrassed. We just didn't know. She said, but my wife felt like that's what we should do. And pastor was at home so the choir got on their knees they stopped everything and they prayed for Chrissy pastor Jim was at home he said when Carol got home she walked up to me and she looked me in the eyes and she said Jim it's done he said what do you mean it's done she said Jim tonight I can't explain it but we we reached heaven he said they wept, they thanked God, they prayed together, they went to sleep and the next morning he said guys the next morning we wake up and there's a knock on the door and he said, I opened the door and right before my eyes is my daughter on her knees, broken and weeping, saying, Mom and Dad, I've sinned against God. Please forgive me. I've run from God. Please forgive me. Pastor Jim said, I got down and I picked my daughter up and I embraced her and I told her how much we love her and that God forgives her and we forgive her. And she backed away from me, he said, and she had tears in her eyes and she looked at me and she said, Daddy, I've got to ask you a question. He said, what's that, sweetheart? She said, Daddy, who was praying for me last night? He said, what do you mean? She said, last night about this time, last night she said, the spirit of God began to convict my heart. And she said, I began to realize I've run from God. I've, 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 I've hurt the heart of God. I've, I've, I've embarrassed my family. She said, man, I repented last night. I got my heart back with God and I knew I had to come home and ask for your forgiveness. And daddy, I just want to know who was praying for me. Friends, can I be really, really honest with you this morning? I don't fully understand stories like that. But what I know is that God's ways are higher than our ways. What I know is that we have direct access to the heart of God through prayer. And what I know is the God we serve is not only sovereign, but with him, nothing is impossible. No one is too far from God. No one is too far gone. No one is without hope. And here's what I know. I know this, that you and I as individuals and as churches, we can't just be like my son and sit down and quit when things get hard, when things get hopeless, when there seems to be no life 
light at the end of the tunnel. That's when we get on our knees in a, in a, in a firmer way. That's when we chase the heart and the power and the presence of God together in prayer and we beg God to do what only God can do. I have no idea what you're dealing with and I have no idea the timeline in which God wants to move in it or how God's gonna choose to move. But what I know is if you're a child of God and you get on your face before God today, God hears your cries and God can do the impossible. So this morning I'm talking to two people in this room and we're, we're done. First of all, if you're here and you've never given your life to Christ today, let me tell you something. This morning, he is pursuing you. You're not by accident here to be here this morning. He is pursuing you. He loves you. He is, he's willing to forgive you. And all of your sin of your past and the shame of your past can be forgiven. And you can be made new in Christ. I'm begging you not to leave this place without giving your life to Christ. You say, what do I do? Find a staff member, find me after and simply say, man, I want to give my life to Jesus. There'll be somebody out of the welcome that say, I can't leave this place without giving my life to Christ. I'm telling you, man, he'll transform your life. It doesn't mean it'll be easy, but it does mean it'll be radically different. The second person I'm talking to is all of you who are followers today. You've got somebody in your life that's running from God or doesn't know God. You've got a burden that you're bearing in your heart today that's causing you anxiety, it's causing you to fear, it's causing you to, 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 to wake up in the middle of the night, it's causing you all these things that are pressuring you. And man, today, here's my challenge to you. I'm going to challenge you, like this church, to lay it before the Lord Jesus. In fact, in just a moment, we're going to stand and sing, and here's what I'm going to I'm going to challenge you. Man, that burden you're bearing, that weight, that thing that's crushing your heart and your spirit, it's paralyzing you in fear. Man, there's nothing special about this. This is nothing but carpet and, 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 and concrete. But it postures your heart to say, God, I'm coming and laying something down and I'm crying out to you because, God, I can't do it. I can't. But you can. So today, all over this place, you have burdens. You have heaviness. You have things that are just hard. Man, can I just encourage you to just come and just lay it before the Father today? He cares for you. The most daring prayer you can pray is for that son or that daughter, that grandson or granddaughter that doesn't know Christ because only Christ can answer that prayer. That's the most daring you can do. Are you praying for them? Are you seeking the presence and the power of God? All over this place today, man, you have burdens. Christ is here to meet you right where you are. Maybe you need to find somebody in this room that just say, would you pray with me? I'm crushed. I need God to move. Whatever God wants you to do, would you be just faithful in that today as you lay those things down? Father, I pray by the power of your Holy Spirit all over this room, God, that people would begin to understand that you want to meet them right where they are. And that, Father, you'd give us even courage in the moment to come and lay these things down at your feet, Father. Father, not that we would be timid, but we would be bold. God, not that we would be quiet, but we would be earnest and fervent and strenuous and praying and asking you to do what only you can do in the lives of us or, or those we know we love that aren't walking with you or don't know you. That relationship situation, that work situation, that health situation, God, whatever it is that is just crushing us today, would you meet us where we are? God, would you allow us to release and cast those things on you? Christ's name. Let's stand together. We're going to begin singing just all over this room. I mean, if God, if you're just bearing a weight, would you just come and lay it down before the Father? There's nothing fancy about what we're doing. It's just a time for you to go, God, I want to just lay this down. I can't bear this alone. As we sing this morning, you just excuse yourself and just come get on your face before the Lord as God would direct you this morning. <laughs>